I uh, was especially blessed by those announcements. Um, I just couldn't help but keep thinking about all those little guys, not so little guys. You know, our Awana program is very important because as a pastor, having done the funeral for the suicide of a 16-year-old this past month, I see those little guys for all the value that God's given them. I look over here, I see junior hires and high schoolers, and I can't even imagine the pressure on them as they go through young adulthood. But we are God's most valuable commodity. Do you know that? We, the breath of God is in us, and we are God's most valuable commodity. And Jesus said, don't keep the kids from coming to me. And we believe that here. Because after you've done the funeral for a 16-year-old, it changes your perspective. And if you don't know it, we have had other attempts in the last few weeks we are under a cloud of attack. You may not know about this game called Blue Whale. But Blue Whale is an online game that many kids are familiar with. And what it is, it's 50 steps on the way to killing yourself. Did you know that might be what your kid's playing on their phone? Your grandkid might be playing that on their phone? And it starts out very simply by you know, you just kind of start by hating somebody or hating yourself and you move on to cutting things into your arm and then you move on to ignoring people. But there's always some sort of self-inflicted pain. And after you get through the first 49 steps, the last step is that you finally take your life. And so when I look at these young men and young ladies in that video... I want to know why we all aren't here on Wednesday night. Because the world has influence and the world has power and we have a real enemy. And he's not content just to move you away from following Jesus. He wants to take your life once and for all, forever, to remove us from the love and the presence and the comfort of God. And that's outside these doors. That's alive and well on Lassen High School campus. It's working at Diamond View Middle School. It's working out at Janesville School. This Wednesday, there's going to be a meeting about that. And some folks have called together clergy and they've called together law enforcement. So I'm going to ask you to do two things. Number one, you pray for this suicide prevention group that's going to be meeting on Wednesday. And number two, that you pray for our Awana kids in this group of junior hires and high schoolers over here because in this world, there's real se sex trafficking. Do you know that? There's real sex trafficking in this world. There's real teenage suicide in this world. And those young girls that were so precious and sweet and brought such a smile to our face, could be trafficked, they could be victims of spousal abuse, they could be victims of abandonment by their parents. And those young boys, those fifth and sixth graders, they could potentially grow up to do great harm, or they could grow up to be men of God. So church, I want us to pray this morning for John L. in the task that she's taken on willingly to bring hope to young people and her junior high workers who had how many this Wednesday? 30 -some, 35. 30 -some, 35 junior hires on Wednesday night just beginning to explore teenage years. Oh, we've been tasked, church, 
with a huge responsibility, not just to proclaim the gospel, but to protect the youngest and the most vulnerable in our midst, amen? So would you pray with me, Father God? We pray for our community. Father, we pray protection over our high school kids, over our junior high kids, over those precious Awana kids. God, would you give us ways to influence them for your kingdom? Father, would you push the evil one away from our children and grandchildren and the kids in this community? Father, would you remind us that we are called to protect those that are under our care? God, would you be with every high school teacher, every high school and junior high counselor, every school, God, locally here, that they might find ways to push back this tide of suicide. Lord, would you be with us as we gather Wednesday to seek ways to creatively intervene for those that feel helpless and hopeless and lost. Father, give us understanding of the world in which we live where the enemy prowls like a roaring lion. God, give us the eyes of your son Jesus so that we might see the value of not just every child and young teenager, but God, we might see the value of every human life. God, thank you for a moment to pause and be reminded about the seriousness of this task. We ask all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so that was a little heavy, so let's stand up, smile, shake hands. You know, every pastor's reference that I read says, people hate to greet one another. <laughs> but today we're just going to do that, so make everyone feel welcome if you would. Oh, well, that's no good. Okay. All right, that's good. Make sure everybody gets a touch. Hey, brother. Make sure everybody gets a touch. Hey, brother. <laughs> okay. 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 I didn't say for you to touch everybody. I said make sure everybody gets a touch. <laughs> So one last thing before we jump into the sermon. And this can't be right. That says 1201. Oh, that's much better. So uh, uh, last week uh, and, and today, we started our, our new series. We used to call it Growth and Leadership Institute. But because adult Sunday school is too lame and Growth and Leadership Institute was too intimidating... We've now changed adult Sunday school to dig, delighting in God. So right now, they're, they're going through a story called the studies. It's the old OGs of the OT. That's the original guys of the Old Testament, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac. So at 9 o'clock, if you would like to come be a part of that, James Giles and his teaching team would love to have you be a part of that. Because dig is better. It just works, doesn't it? W will some of you come now because it's called dig? Okay, all right, beautiful. Look at that, James. It worked. So anyway, uh, let's jump in. And by way of review, you know we're talking about following Jesus. Talking about following Jesus. Now in our world, in a perfect world, every parent would be all in in raising their kids, right? And, and some of you are very good parents because when it comes to raising your kids, you are all in. And I think that's a wonderful thing. If you're a parent, you should be all in. 
Because our problems now is, is we have these part-time parents, some uninterested parents, and, and, and some parents that, you know, would rather be their child's best friend rather than their parent. So we understand that, that not everybody's all in when it comes to certain things. But when it comes to following Jesus, he was pretty clear about the expectations. And I come back again to Matthew 16. Jesus says very clearly, if you want to follow me, and I love the fact that he gives us a choice. If you don't want to follow me, don't follow me. You, you can follow a lot of things in this world. But Jesus kind of makes it clear just right up front. If you're going to follow me, then here's your job description. Well, I didn't know there was a job description at church. Absolutely there's a job description at church. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, and you don't have to if you don't want to, but if you choose to say yes to this amazing adventure, this amazing journey, if you choose to say yes to Jesus, and I hope you have, then you must. And this is the part church people doesn't like. You know, I just want to follow Jesus and have do all the fun stuff that Christians do. Well, Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, then here's the job description. Turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and then follow me. So Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, I want you to be all in. Because you know what I really hate? is bandwagon people. You know what bandwagon people is? Bandwagon people are those when they find out the Dodgers are going to win the World Series, all of a sudden they're Dodger fans. Hey, where were you for the last three or four years when we never made it? I never heard from you. You see, bandwagon people find out what's happening and then they go be a part of that. But Jesus isn't looking for bandwagon fans. Jesus is looking for followers. And when you choose to follow, because you don't have to choose to follow, he expects you to be all in. And last week, we talked about life transformation. Life transformation is an obvious sign that you are following Jesus. Life transformation tells you and it tells everybody around you because the Holy Spirit is transforming your life into this new identity. It's not a better me. It's a brand new me. That life transformation is an obvious sign that I'm all in and God is doing things through me. Now today, we want to look at all in and what it means in terms of spiritual gifting. Spiritual gifts are something that we've all have. And God expects our spiritual gifts to be used to serve each other, to serve his church, and to serve his kingdom. Three areas that we have to be concerned about. One another, the church at large, and then his kingdom around the world. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts today. I don't want you to roll your eyes and say, I know what spiritual gifts are. Wah, 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 wah. Because we're not going to describe spiritual gifts. I'm not going to explain them to you. But I am going to challenge you that God created you uniquely, specifically, divinely for certain purposes. And if you are not doing those things, you're missing your best life. So, if you need a Bible, raise your hand fellows give you one if you don't have a bible you keep this you read it during the week you bring it back next week so if you need a bible raise your hand once you get that bible turn to psalm 139 it should be about in the middle of your bible psalm 139 we're going to begin by talking about whatever you do and we all do something right we all do something so two biblical statements this first statement is true for every single human being. Every single human being that's ever drawn breath on this planet, this next verse is true of them. Psalm 139, 14. Thank you, God, for making me so wonderfully complex. Your version might have those words, fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you, God, for making me so complex. Thank you, God, that I am wonderfully made. Thank you, God, that, that I am unique. 
Your workmanship, God, is marvelous. How well I know it. You ever seen God's workmanship? You ever seen how marvelous it is? Take your hand and do this with all five fingers. Everybody, even you, Matthew, yes. Now take your other hand and do this. Now, if you can, lift one leg. Isn't this wonderfully complex? I tried to teach my dog that for years. He never could get it. So I gave up. He wasn't wonderfully and complexly made. We are, though, aren't we? Because God has made us uniquely and specifically for something. We are wonderfully complex. God's workmanship is marvelous. Look at your neighbor and say, you're marvelous. You're marvelous. All of us are marvelous. Now, second verse, second statement that is only true of God's people. Only Christians, only believers, only followers of Christ find themselves in this next verse. Paul is talking to the church at Ephesus. Look what he tells Christians. For we, the family of God, you and I who are Christ followers, we are God's masterpieces. We're cut above those other folks, not in a superior way, but it says you who have decided to follow Jesus, you who have come to the Christian faith, you are God's masterpiece. He has created you and I brand new, a new identity, not a better me, but a brand new me. He has created us anew in Jesus Christ. And there's a reason we're created new. So, here's why you're God's masterpiece. Here's why you're a brand new person in Jesus Christ. So you and I can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Did you know that God planned amazing things for you before he hung one star in the sky? Do you know that before God breathed breath into Adam and Eve, he planned me? to be on this stage, on this Sunday, in front of you, preaching this message. God knew that, and he planned it for me. And he planned for you to be here. And, fortunately, we have obediently complied. You see, anything that God planned for us to do for his kingdom means that we have to be willing you don't have to be willing to do the God things that God's planned for you because some people that aren't here today said no. Some people that used to be in church said no. Some people that should be in this church or another church serving God faithfully and regularly, they have said no to that challenge. They have said no to that task. So understand, when we see that we're God's masterpieces, when we see that we've been created anew in Christ Jesus, when we see that he planned things for us to do long ago, that we still have the opportunity to say no thanks. Willingness is important in our relationship with God. And then we come to Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Paul says, Church, work willingly at whatever you do. There's that key word, to be willing. Work willingly at whatever you do for God. Doesn't matter what you do for God, because we all do different things for God. But whatever you do, you do it willingly. As though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Now, for me, as a pastor, I answer to the elders. The elders answer to you people. So there's kind of a hierarchy, a chain of command. Every good church should have that. But in all honesty, I have a boss that's more important and bigger than you all. And his name is God. And one day he's going to ask me about how good or how poor a job I did in the gifts that he's given me. So church, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people because we should remember that we have this inheritance in heaven 
And as I serve God faithfully, my inheritance in heaven gets bigger and more amazing all the time. Now, I appreciate the inheritance that my family left me, but I appreciate more the spiritual inheritance that my family left me. But as good as that is, there's a different inheritance awaiting us. And we need to work with that inheritance in mind, willingly as unto the Lord. So, let's move on. Let's talk about you are gifted. I'm gifted, you're gifted, we're all gifted. We're all gifted, that's good. Look at your neighbor and say, you're gifted. You're, you're gifted. Say it with some emotion, you're gifted. Because nobody wants, you're gifted. Nobody wants, you're gifted. We want, you're gifted. You're gifted. Spiritual gifts are given for the purpose of service to others, service to the local church, and service to the kingdom of God. God has given you, he's gifted you uniquely, specifically, individually. He's gifted you. Though the Bible doesn't give a definition of spiritual gifts, it does list the spiritual gifts, and it reveals much about those spiritual gifts' nature and function. We're not going to talk about any of that today because my focus is that you understand that you're gifted and you do something with that gift. Paul says this. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 7. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There's different gifts, but the same Spirit. Pastor Floyd loves numbers. That's his gift. I hate numbers, but we share the same Spirit. Pastor Steve is a merciful, compassionate, congregational care pastor. When he comes to visit you at the hospital, he is amazing. When I come to see you at the hospital, not so much. But it's the same Spirit. God's Holy Spirit has given Rick this unique set of gifts and talents. The Holy Spirit has given Pastor Steve this amazing gifts and talents. And he's given me a few, but they are so different and aren't you glad? But it's the same Spirit. It's the same Spirit. And then Peter tells us this, 1 Peter 4, 10. Each one of you, each one of you Christ followers, each one of you Christians should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Whatever gift you got, you should be busy doing it, and you've got a gift. And then again, Paul in Romans chapter 12. Just as each one of us has one body with many members. Remember this? One body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body. In this room, together you and I, it's one body. You may not like that, you may push against that, but I need you and you need me. And that may make some of you angry. But that's what Scripture said. I didn't dream that up, because if I would have dreamed it up, I would have left some of you out. Just telling you the truth. And if you dreamed it up, you might have left some of us out. I get that. But Paul is making a very important point. Collectively, we are better together than we are individually. And the kingdom of God is influenced and moves forward when we work together rather than individually. But yet, individually is what we must contribute to make the whole better. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. We have different personalities. 
We have different perspectives. We have different opinions. But we are one according to God's giftedness. You see, what we have to stop doing in the church is arguing about our gifts. What we have to stop doing in the church is arguing about the best way to do a potluck. We have to start arguing about the best way to play Awana games. What we have to do is use our strengths to build one another up, to build up the local church, and to promote the kingdom of God. You're gifted. And when you say no to using your gift in the midst of a local church, then you have said no to the plans that God has laid out for you long ago. So, turn with me to Romans 16. Romans 16, because Paul gives us an amazing picture of the church in Rome. And what Paul does in Romans 16 is he gives a shout out to those people who are making a difference. He gives a shout out to those people in the church that know their unique gifting. They are using their unique gifting for each other, for the local church, and for the expansion of the gospel. Listen to what Paul says, Romans 16, verses 1 to 16. It's long. I'm just going to read it and not make any comments. But you listen to what Paul says about these people. Romans chapter 16, verses 1 to 16. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon in the church in Centria. Welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honor among God's people. Help her in whatever she needs, for she has been helpful to many people, especially me, Paul says. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Jesus Christ. In fact, once Priscilla and Aquila risked their lives for me, and I am thankful to them, and so are all the Gentile churches. Also give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. Greet my dear friend Imponidas. He was the first person from the province of Asia, Asia that became a follower of Christ. Give my greetings to Mary, who has worked so hard for your benefit. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews, who were in prison with me. They are highly respected among the apostles and became followers of Christ before I did. Verse 8. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachys. Greet Apellus, a good man whom the Lord approves. Give my greeting to the believers from the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet the Lord's people from the household of Narcissus. Give my greetings to Tryphenia and Tryphosa, the Lord's workers who are and to our dear Persis, who has worked so hard for the Lord. Greet Rufus whom the Lord picked out to be his very own, and also his dear mother, who has been like a mother to me, Paul says. Give my greeting to Asyncritus, Phelion, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who meet with them. Give my greetings to Philagius, to Julia, to Nereus, and his sister, and to Olympus, and to all the believers who meet with them. Greet each other in Christian love. All the churches send you their greetings. If Paul was giving a shout out to community church, what would he say about you? What would he say about you? Oh, and greet so-and-so who makes it to church two out of every eight weeks. Oh, greet so-and-so who has this amazing gift, but they have chosen not to use it for the kingdom of God. Or would they say, greet my dear brother and sister who are so amazingly gifted and are using their gifts for the kingdom of God. What would Paul say about you? Five reasons why you and I need to pursue and develop our spiritual gifting. Some of you have been in church for a long time and you could quote me spiritual gifts frontwards and backwards. Some of you have taken more spiritual gift tests than you care to remember. Some of you have been encouraged and some of you have been pushed and prodded and probed to get you to do something in the kingdom of God. I'm not doing any of that today. 
I just want you to seriously consider that God has made you uniquely to serve him in the ways that he planned long ago. Long ago. You can go to www.cefchurch.com on the home page, on the very front page, there is a spiritual gifts assessment tool. You can download that. You can answer the questions. You can download the self-correcting answer sheet. And then you can go make an appointment with Pastor Floyd and say, what does all this mean? Or if you know what it means, take it to Pastor Floyd and say, where can you use me best? Where might God be calling me based on my unique, special, one-of-a-kind talents, abilities, and gifting? Because you probably would not want to hear Gwen Floyd preach next Sunday. Now, she would do an admirable job because she loves the Lord and she loves Scripture. But I'll tell you what, if you ever want to feel cared for, if you ever want someone to shower you with mercy and compassion and pray for you, that's your girl. Because when she prays for you, <laughs> when Gwen prays for you, heaven and earth are moved. I can attest to that. You see, she might not do her best work up here, but I know where she does do her best work. And every single one of you have unique gifting and talents that God has given to you and only to you, and He's laid out this plan of good works for you from the beginning, wherever that was, and you and I have the chance to say yes or no. The chance to say yes or no to that. Reason number one why you and I should pursue and develop our spiritual gifts. Number one is direction and purpose in life. When you understand your gifting, it will give you direction and purpose, not just as a Christian, but as a human being. When you do what God uniquely wired you to do, because I've had a job before, that was nothing more than a means to paying the bills. You ever have a job like that? All you, the only reason you gave them eight hours a day is because you knew at the end of the month there was a mortgage payment and groceries had to be bought. And you went out there and you bit your teeth, grit your teeth, and you gripped your hands and you did whatever it take to pay the mortgage and to feed the family. But some of you found a job that you woke up every day you couldn't get there fast enough because what you were doing what you were a part of was something that you were so uniquely created for you just didn't want to ever call in sick you see to be fully self-actualized to be vibrant to be totally alive, to live the abundant life that Jesus promised is when you find what you're uniquely wired to do for others, for the local church, and for the kingdom of God. And when you do it, you'll never work a day in your life. My wife is in the next room doing what she's done for 40 years, which is love little kids. And maybe some of you in this room were part of her class 20 years ago and she loved on you. Maybe you in this room know how well my wife loves the little guys. Maybe your grandchildren have received from her what they would never ever receive from me, Pastor Floyd, or Pastor Steve. What my wife is uniquely and specifically created to do is to love little kids. And she does it better than anybody I know. No offense to our children's ministry staff. I'm a little biased. But understand, direction and purpose in your life comes when you find it. You, you, you remember the one thing, you remember Curly, and you remember the one thing in City Slickers, and they kept looking for the one thing? I'm telling you, who knows your one thing? His name is God, 
and he's already given you that one thing. You and I just have to find it and develop it. Secondly, what happens, why we should pursue and develop our spiritual gifts? Freedom to embrace and enjoy who you are. Freedom to embrace and enjoy who you are. What is holy and what is sacred is when we enjoy the freedom to be you. Not the you that you want others to see, but the you that God created you to be. Third reason why we should pursue and develop our spiritual gifts is joy. It's joy. Joy results from living out your purpose in doing what God created you to do. The Greek word for joy, gifts, and grace all have the same root word. The same root word we get joy, grace, and gifts from in the Greek. Joy comes. You ever watch Lonnie play the drums? When Lonnie plays the drums, sometimes he has trouble keeping the beat. You know why? Because he's worshiping. <laughs> there is no greater joy than Lonnie Reed playing the drums and worshiping God because you know what Lonnie was created to do? To worship God and he has a drumming gift and sometimes worshiping God gets in the way of his drumming gift. Fourth thing, why we should pursue and develop our spiritual gifts is affirmation. When you know and operate in your gifting, it's a proclamation to the world. I can only do what I do for one reason. Jesus Christ has changed my life. Because see, people that have the gift of conversation like I do, I could have went to a school and taught at a school. I could have went to a college and been a professor and been a lecturer because I have that makeup. But I would have hated that because I want to preach and talk about Jesus. I want to shepherd and care for the people that God's put under my care. Oh, I could have went up to Lassen College and I would have hated it. But for me, I've never worked a day in my life because I've been serving Jesus. I've been doing the one thing he created me to do. Affirmation. When you do what God's gifted you to do, everybody that sees you, how is it you do that so well? Because God is a God of grace and mercy. Now, the last thing, the last reason is tough. It's accountability. And I mentioned this early on. You see, each of us will be held responsible for the thing that God has given us to do. And we don't like to talk about this. This is called the Bema Seat Judgment in theology. And what God's going to do to every Christian, this isn't a judgment of whether I'm saved or not. That's been taken care of on the cross. But I do have a moment of judgment before God. And he's going to say, Rick, what did you do with what I gave you? He's not going to compare me to Billy Graham and say, look what Billy Graham did. You were kind of less than. He's not going to compare me to Pastor Rick, to Pastor Steve. He's going to say, Rick, I entrusted you with X amount of time. I entrusted you with X amount of wealth. I entrusted you with X amount of energy. And I entrusted you with these spiritual gifts. What? did you do? And I want to say, I did the best I could. I want to say, I was faithful to what you had given me. I did my best to walk that path of good works that God, you prepared for me long ago. Paul says this in Romans, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Speaking to Christians, speaking to believers, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account. Each of us will give a personal account to the God of heaven for what he had given to us and what we chose to do with it. That's a theological point. That's a theological fact. Every Bible-believing, gospel-teaching church will tell you that's what the Bible says. And then in 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, For we all must stand before Christ and be judged. We will each receive, Christians, 
we will receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we have done in this earthly life. That's the seriousness of spiritual gifting. That's the seriousness of walking in God's agenda rather than working in our agenda. But it's real easy to look at this and say, well, I'll worry about that when I get there. Um, That's probably not a good way of thinking. Whatever God's gifted you to do, whatever God's uniquely given to you, whatever God's specifically and individually given to you as a spiritual gift, whether it's administration, whether it's the gift of mercy, whether it's the gift of pastoral care, whether it's the gift of drumming, whether it's the gift of greeting people in the lobby, or it's the gift of caring for children. You see, in Scripture, some people see as many as 27 spiritual gifts. In Scripture, some people see as few as 12 spiritual gifts. Some people will tell you Some of the spiritual gifts in the New Testament aren't functioning today. Some people will tell you that all of the spiritual gifts in the New Testament are functioning today. I'm not here to argue about how many and which ones are functioning. What I'm here to do is to remind us that we have been gifted and called by God for a specific work or ministry and that we live lives less than when we say no to the things of God. Shape. There are a lot of spiritual gift inventories, assessment tools, lots of definitions, lots of explanations, lots of ways to get carried away with spiritual gifts, lots of ways to negate spiritual gifts. But shape is simple. It's an acronym that summarizes five aspects of how God has wired us to serve. What's your shape? Let me quickly go through these. The S is for spiritual gifts. What has God supernaturally gifted you to do? What has God supernaturally given to you to do? Do you know what that is? Have you ever been concerned about what that is? It was very clear those verses from Paul and from Peter, we're all gifted. We've been given something by God and he has high expectations in terms of those spiritual gifts. What has God supernaturally gifted you to do? The H, what's your heart's passion? What's your heart's passion? Is it children? Is it teenagers and junior hires? Have you been moved by this story about blue whale? Has that stirred in you? Then maybe God is calling you to some kind of ministry to either suicide prevention, working with high schoolers and junior hires, some sort of care ministry that will reach out to young people. What's your heart's passion? Well, I have a passion to stay home and watch football. That's not it, I'm sorry. Ah, wrong answer. What's your heart's passion? Well, my heart's passion is to get retired and get in the Winnebago and off we go. If that's your heart's passion, I hope you only choose to do that a few months of the year. If that's your heart's passion, I hope that in your travels you choose to use the spiritual gifts that God's given to you. What's your heart's passion? The A is what's your abilities? What's your abilities? What natural talents do you have? We just had a group of folks go out to Anna Floyd's house with natural talents, skills, and abilities. And they did things there that I, number one, never could do, remodeling her house. And number two, I don't want to do. I'm not that good. You don't want me remodeling anything for you. (laughs) But we had those with those gifts and talents and the temperament to go and do that. What natural talents and skills do you have? In peace, personality style. Where does your personality best suit you to serve? Where where would you do best at? The welcome center? The nursery? Greeter? What's your personality? See, if I went 
to the Nazarene church, they would send me back before I got my notes open. If I went out to Susanville Assembly, they would be cordial and gracious, but they would say, why don't you go back to community church? You know why? Because long ago, God knew my personality fit right here with you all. And you know what God knew about you? Your personality fit right here with us all. Personality style. All of this comes to play in the, the big call that God has put on your life. The E is experience. What life experiences do you have? What spiritual experiences do you have? What educational or ministry experiences do you have? What, what in your past can be used right now to encourage and bless others and to further the kingdom of God? What do you got back there? That's what I love about men's breakfast because we hear guys share their testimony. And when you hear that the associate warden used to be a son of a gun, you scratch your head and go, are you kidding me? I mean, after all, Pastor Steve got a few skeletons in his closet. <laughs> Jim Dunn, we won't even go there. <laughs> Joshua, he was a train wreck for a while. What life experiences what background has God brought you through so that your unique gifts can be used in the here and now? You see, if you look at spiritual gifts alone, it would be easy. Oh, that guy, he's an accountant at the high school, so he must want to be an accountant at the church. No, that guy at the high school is an accountant because that's what he does for a living. What he's really gifted to do is to teach. He wants to teach financial stewardship so you and I can be better stewards of the money God's given me. But if he's just an accountant, all we want him to do is count the offering on Sunday. That's not how spiritual gifts work. Oh, he's a bus driver for the city. He must want to drive the church bus. No, what he really wants to do is to be on the worship team. You see, we've got to stop doing that to people based on what we see. We need to trust that God is showing them what he's called them to do. You see, and you can ask other people. What do they see you doing well? What do other people know about your personality? What do other people think you can do well? Ask them. What, what do you see me doing for God's kingdom? Because they may see things that you never considered. And here's something that's fun to do. Ask the what if question. What if you could do anything for God, financial resources were not a problem, manpower resources were not a problem. What would you do for God if resources weren't a problem and you were guaranteed to be successful? What would you do for God? Tony Esparza told me he'd run a 24-hour soup kitchen. He already answered that question. Grabbed me after the first service and said, I'd run a 24-hour soup kitchen. He's already thinking about that question. I told him on Sunday they could have menudo. Just my thoughts. What would you do if success was guaranteed and resources were not going to be a problem? What would you do for the kingdom of God? That, answering that question might give you some direction. Man, I would go find every sex trafficker and string them up by the feet. <laughs> what would you do? You see, answering that question will give you some direction. You see, here's the bottom line, and worship team, you can come up. Jump into something. Grow in the process of trial and error. I don't know what God's called you to do, but I know one thing, God's called you to do something, and he's gifted you uniquely, specifically, and individually to do that task. And the church and the kingdom of God is weaker when you say no to that task. God has shaped you and me for significance and service. God has shaped you and me for significance. Significance. Service. 
where we started this morning was with these words from Paul. Work willingly at whatever you do, church, as though you were working for the Lord. What will you do for the Lord this week? What will you do that only you are uniquely qualified to do because God gave it to you? Four questions. Number one, for we are God's master's peace. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. Are you doing the good things He planned for you? Secondly, Romans 16, Paul's giving a shout out to the church in Rome. What would be said about you? Greet Rich McIntosh, my brother in Christ, who has served alongside of me in ministry for the last decade. Spiritual gifts are biblical. We've seen that clearly today. Spiritual gifts are biblical. They are given to every believer and they're expected to be put into practice. How are you doing in terms of your spiritual gifting? See, some people think their spiritual gift is to be a pain in the neck. That's not a spiritual gift. Lastly, Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord, church. Are you ready to jump in? Take that online inventory. Go to the website. Talk to Pastor Floyd. Talk to your spouse. Ask them what they see in you that you don't see. We're going to close with a song. It's called I Have a Maker. And you do. And he made you specifically, uniquely, individually for a purpose long time ago. Are you walking in those good works? Are you willing to say yes to those things God's called you to? My prayer is that if you're wrestling with these things, that you would meet God right there in your chair. The altar will be open if you want to make a statement that way. God will meet you here as well. So church, let's stand. Let's sing this song about the God who has made us uniquely, wonderfully, individually for things, for things that enhance His kingdom.